It's a strange thing about this hobby because one month you're talking about the watch, the brand, its problems, and then saying things like, I've really liked this watch a lot from the very beginning and it's sort of a dream to have the 62 MAS in the collection. And then four months later, you own the watch. And the craziest thing is I found it for the same price as a vintage Smith's Field watch, a W10. Was it worth the trade? So I've been racking my brain trying to think what this video should be about. A casual hands-on review or maybe a story about what this watch signifies to me as an enthusiast and the journey of getting here. Maybe it could be something more introspective about spending time knowing the watches you want and why you chase them and how you should strive for the watch you really want. I think for my last video that I made about Seiko and this watch in general was that I didn't believe that the ends justified the means. Now that's not the correct use of the expression, but you know, the price wouldn't match the level of skill and detail put into the dial and the most important places. And well, I was wrong, but this watch does symbolize the very best and worst of modern Seiko. And even though I still own the watch, I stand by that statement 100%. My thoughts in this area haven't changed. That said, the best outweighs the worst. Let's dive in. What can be said about the 6217 that hasn't already been said? The progenitor, Seiko's first dive watch, Japan's first dive watch. It's an icon. It's a grail for the Seiko diehard, for the dive watch enthusiast. It's the kind of piece that an enthusiast would stop you on the side of the street and say, is that what I think it is? And look, this is why it's amazing. It's, it's the very watch that paved the road for the development of every other diver to come. It's Seiko's Rosetta Stone. The funny thing is, I have never been a Seiko guy. I admired their history and some of their amazing original designs, but I didn't grow up with the brand, believe it or not. Like many of you did, it was just never a first watch for me. And hindsight, Maybe it should have been. It's interesting to think how our interactions with first watches take us down a certain path. They do in a lot of ways shape our tastes and our preferences. If you started life with a Seiko, you can almost guarantee that on a deeper level you appreciate them. If you began with an Omega or a Rolex, that relationship is indelible. And we all have certain points of views about what made them special to us. So my case is quite different. And in a strange twist after experiencing Longines, Oris, Omega, Rolex, Zenith, now circling back to owning a significant Seiko, even after experiencing such a model like the SPB143 Prospex a few years back, I get to look at and experience this watch through a different lens, a far more appreciative lens, I think. And that's what I want this video to be about. Now, one of the biggest underlying problems with the brand at the moment is how their prices have shifted upwards, but also how many of their movements, even in the higher tiers, aren't regulated as well as they should be. And the SJE093 exhibits all of this. I believe double the price of an SPB Prospex equivalent. And it's asking that question if a watch like this should be worth that exponential price increase. I for one don't think so. These sorts of original designs should be accessible to everybody. And it got me thinking just as I was preparing this video that in a way it feels just like Seiko's version of how a brand like Blancpain operates. Small batch numbers, limited editions with perfect sizes, perfect dials, but are twice the price as regular models. They do it because they know these original designs will sell no matter the price. And even though it's a 5% change in all the small areas that make up such a beautiful design, there will always be people out there pursuing them. Now, I'm a very bad case for this argument because if you know me and the watches that I like, I pursue a very niche area of this hobby, which is chasing after the originals. I have no idea where it began, but an original design that represents a brand at a certain point of their history is great. And the first of everything is always pivotal. These original designs carry so much more weight to me, and beyond the beauty, there's always this constant reminder that this was the first of its kind, that it epitomizes, let's say, 1965 watch design, and it's a cornerstone watch belonging to the brand. It adds that little asterisk in the corner. Now, putting all of that aside, I don't care for the vintage watch aspect, or the piece unique element, or the limited edition, or the inflated prices. I am just after the original design in its purest form if that makes sense. Please rate my craziness in the comments. Now the 62 MAS seed was planted in 2017 when the SLAs arrived on the scene. Original Seiko divers, I mean they are the secret source, right? 
A few years later, the SPBs arrived, a tamer, more affordable, well-made variation of the more hardcore SLAs. And this is where I jumped on. My first heavy-hitting Seiko was the SPB-143. I bought it because I wanted to experience it. I wanted to see how the quality control had been improved, how it would compare to a Tudor Black Bay, how much more detail had been put into these models and to see what the fuss was all about. Subconsciously though, and I think we are all guilty of doing this, I wanted the watch because I wanted a 6.2 MAS. And every time I looked at it, it gave me the same feeling. As close as it might be to the watch it's paying tribute to in some places, the pedantic, design-obsessed piece of fat in between my ears would always say, this is not a 6.2 MAS. And with that thought constantly going around in my head, I never looked at the watch the same way again. Now this is just me. Your mileage may differ. All right, let's stop dancing around it. This watch is exquisite. It's hard to be objective because I now own it, but it is beautiful. Attention to detail on the case and especially on the dial, I will say it's, it presents better than a Rolex. This is Grand Seiko level quality. The brushed rhodium dial is a real standout, going from deep black to slate gray to light gray and everything in between, contrasting with the glossy bezel insert. You'll probably see in the footage how this changes in the light, depending on the time of day. But it's then the emphasis of the polished surrounds and how different they are to the standard models. These stand out so much more, increasing the watch's legibility, but also showing you just how different each plot is. The 12 o'clock marker is different compared to the 9 and the 6. Every other plot has a trapezoidal effect that you will see the best when you see the loom shot. And the loom on this watch, it's disgusting. It puts anything to shame. Throughout the day, the loom is wanting to work, no matter the environment that you're in. And that light green choice of color was deliberately chosen to represent sewer loom, some of the earliest loom that was associated to these models. Then the other small things that you don't necessarily notice, like the handset, how the hour hand is just slightly bigger than the minute hand, how you can see a polished bevel surrounding them, and also how the lengths of these hands are so spot on, how they nearly touch every marker but don't. It's the little things that this sort of watch corrects, like the two lines of text corresponding at the top and underneath, and how nicely balanced it presents. How the polished frame around the date window is not too big, not too small, it actually mirrors the 9 o'clock marker. Even down to the typeface used on the bezel insert has been done right here. The original packaging that this watch ships in is also just great. I mean, the typeface is awful. It's, uh, it's like what you would see in a 1970s yacht in Miami, but, you know, Nevertheless, it's just great. The originality is all there. The blue velvet lining. Small details that you don't necessarily notice. And to then zoom out and view it from a macro level, how wonderfully that crown integrates with the smaller sized case. How perfectly balanced and proportionate it feels when it's sitting on the wrist, low in profile. How the size of the case, the length of the lugs, they correspond to the overall diameter of the dial and bezel. When circling back to experience a watch like this again, now in its truest 38 millimeter size. It screams Japanese precision on every level. And regarding the watch's accuracy, it's currently running between plus two and plus five every day. So yes, Seiko accuracy still remains an enigma. And I guess the best way I could describe the experience is that I now wear the Tudor Black Bay 54 as my everyday driver, wearing it to the gym, shower, swimming, whatever else. And when I take that watch off and put the Seiko back on, it feels like a completely different experience. And who am I kidding? The Black Bay 54, it's a terrific watch, one that I still don't think has been spoken about enough, but it also has very similar specifications to this SJE093. With regards to its diameter, its overall thickness, length, how it fits on the wrist, but it's that minutia of detail that the Seiko has that the Black Bay lacks. How the crystal distorts, how the plots have been applied, how the handset feels correct, how everything is evenly spaced, how the loom is just on another level. But at the end of it all, if the watch makes you smile, then I guess it's done something right. I'll say it right here, discounting the name, discounting the significance of the piece, what it represents and all the rest. This is the best example of a skin diver I have ever experienced. And I think it's because of that straight line symmetry on the dial, the weight of the plots, the precision of its hands, the profile on the wrist, its size. The 6.2 MAS design is phenomenal and it's something you can't take away from these watches. I wonder if they will catch on. And I think the biggest reason why this whole experience felt like a win for me is that I gave up on the SPB. I gave up on pursuing Seiko further. There was just nothing in the family that really spoke to me very much. And 
to take the chance on the SJE and to put the money where my mouth was. I mean, even after buying it, I was questioning, did I just buy the same watch again? Will I feel the same way about this that I did the earlier model? And it's that feeling of maybe I wasn't crazy after all. Maybe it was just that 5% of detail that made all the difference to me. So I guess the lesson in this convoluted tale that I try to bring across to people often is to spend the time learning what you want from a watch, to really dig to the core of what matters to you as an enthusiast, be it the brand, the model, the size, its color, its design, whatever. Have a clear picture of why you want it. And most importantly, never compromise on that vision. There is something really special about holding out for the watch that you really want. And spending all that time returning back to it and thinking what if and how can I make this happen and how long will it take? You know, the result, it's so much more rewarding when it finally happens. Because in a lot of ways, it's been your journey, your experience that you're finally able to write off. No one else will necessarily understand, but that's the great part. As you can tell, this video has gone down many different routes with a review in there somewhere, I guess. There's so many reviews of this watch online. But I wanted this to be more of a journey of getting to this point, and maybe it will resonate with one of you out there. Bearing in mind that come next year, we're going to see this collection expanded. We're going to see SJE models of the Willard, maybe the High Beat, maybe the Tuner. So prepare yourselves, because they are on their way. One-to-one -one scale accurate models of the originals. Yes, please. So there you are. That's all I can really say about it, I think. It's hard to review a watch that's been covered so much and has such a deep history, pun intended. But it was one of those opportunities where the watch sort of fell into my lap and I said, you know what, give it a try. And it really feels like that milestone, a privilege to say that I now own this piece. Even though I'm not a Seiko diehard by any means, their first dive watch, technically their second because we're talking about the 8001 with the bigger crown. But anyway, I would just like to thank you so much for being a part of this journey and this hobby with me and for taking the time to watch these videos. It really means a lot and I greatly appreciate it. So. See you in the next one.